How to read sectional charts. This video, I'm going to give you a crash course on some tips for reading a sectional chart like a pro. So whether you are just getting started using sectional charts and you're completely confused, or maybe you've had some experience reading sectional charts, but you're still unsure and not very confident with using sectional charts. This is going to be a crash course to get you on your way for reading sectional charts like a pro. So what I'm going to do is go over uh, a little bit about myself, who I am as a person, this person hosting this video. My name is Heather Monthy, and we're going to go over VFR sectional charts overview. We're going to go over about reading the legend and the margins of your chart. We'll talk about airport information. We'll talk about latitude and longitude. Identifying airspace, this is not a full airspace course. We're going to do a quick review on airspace so that you can learn how to identify it on sectional charts. Then we'll talk about obstacles and terrain. So first, my name is Heather. I am a commercial pilot, certificated flight instructor, CFI, um, and a remote pilot. I am very involved in STEM education and workforce development. I've been That's been my entire career over the last 20 plus years. I'm the founder of Fly Alpha Zulu Aviation Education and also Educators Who Drone. And I am also the host of the Let's Learn to Fly podcast. So let's get to it. VFR sectional charts overview. So the FAA has a spot on their website for the VFR raster charts is what they call them. So you can go to this link here or you can just type into Google uh, FAA VFR raster charts and this link will come right up. And this is where you can get the official images of VFR sectional charts. Uh, depending on which city you want to grab or which chart you want to grab. So these files are huge. Um, you can download them. You can use them to practice, you know, taking a look at things on the internet, that kind of thing. So I do recommend using Sky Vector. It seems to be a little bit easier to use and you don't have to spend all the time downloading these files. But if you wanted to download the files and find the official chart of the FAA, this is where to get it. And you'll see here that they've got the current edition uh, date and then the next edition date. So if it's within 20 days of the next release, there will be a next edition link available for you as well. So for example, if you're going to download the Albuquerque chart, you know, today is October 25th, 2022, you would use this current edition because we're between September 8th and November 3rd. So it's important to note that November 3rd, this is the chart that will go live. Okay. And the AIM, uh, the Aeronautical Information Manual, Chapter 9, does go over aeronautical charts and related publications. I've got a link for you here. It's got all of the information that you need to know about different types of charts that are available. So there's all sorts of different charts. There's sectional aeronautical charts, VFR terminal area charts. There's the Gulf Coast VFR aeronautical chart. There's the Grand Canyon VFR aeronautical chart. There's all these different charts, okay? What we're going to go over today are sectional aeronautical charts. So we're not going to go over some of these other ones, and that will be in a, in a later video here. Uh, but for this purposes, we're going to go over just the sectional charts um, because that's already a lot of information. So again, there's other types of VFR charts. There's the terminal area charts. There's the Gulf Coast VFR charts, the Grand Canyon Caribbean, and then there's the helicopter route charts. Uh, the charts are updated every 56 days. Again, you can see the dates here. We've got September 8th and November 3rd. If you're watching this video at a later time, those dates are going to be different. Just check the link to see what is the most current version for you on that particular day. They're updated every 56 days and they're updated every one year in Alaska. They always are valid and expire on a Thursday. That's sort of the release schedule for the VFR sectional charts. But if anything needs to change within those 56 days, they the FAA will either update information via a NOTAM or a safety alert and charting notice. So the the NOTAM is going to be more um, you know more pertinent information that you need to know right away. It's going to affect you in flight versus the safety alert and charting notice is going to be things like, you know, maybe things are spelled incorrectly or something is something is just incorrect on the chart, but it's not necessarily going to affect your flight. And you can find that information here as well. But if anything is going to affect your flight, something major changes, there's a new obstacle put in place, such as a, a, a water tower, light, you know, a light is out on an obstacle, something like that, it will be updated by a NOTAM. So you want to make sure that you're always checking NOTAMs. 
So I've got a link here to Sky Vector. If you haven't used Sky Vector yet, it's a fantastic website that gives you all of the charts and they sort of seam them all together so that it just looks like one big map for you. But you can also look at the individual charts so you can actually look at the margins and the legends, which I will show you how to use that here in a second. So my next statement here is that you want to make sure that it's, I, I like to say it as this, read the darn chart. Make sure you are reading the chart that you are looking at. There's all sorts of information right on the chart for you. So if you are either taking a written exam or maybe you are in the middle of your check ride and you get a question and you can't answer it, you find a question about a sectional chart and you can't answer it, read the legend, read the margins, read the darn chart. So there is a uh, a book that you will get, one second here. This is the book that you will get as part of your written exam. And let's see if you can bring it in here in the camera. There we go. Um, it's your Airman Knowledge Testing Supplement, okay? And this is valid for sport pilot, recreational pilot, remote pilot, and private pilot. This is the actual document or book that you will receive during your written exam. So if you are taking a look at um, some of the VFR sectional charts in this book. So again, you got some of the, it's hard to see here with my Zoom, sorry. But you can see here, this is page 2-75. You could get questions about that particular chart on your written exam, okay? If you are taking the sport pilot, recreational pilot, remote pilot, private pilot, okay? So you want to go through this book and look at all the different charts Look at all the different diagrams that are in there. You could get, you can and will get questions on them. You can also download that online. I've got a whole separate video on my YouTube channel that actually explains how to use that testing supplement, but we're not going to go over that today. We're going to go over how to actually use the charts. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you read the legend and the margins. So let's go over to Sky Vector right now. So I bring up Sky Vector here. And it's just skyvector.com. And like you can see here, it brings all of the aeronautical charts together. So I've got the whole United States here, okay? And it looks like we've got some weather and then probably some TFRs here as well. So we've got a couple of things. You can, you can set things up so that shows what you want to see, what you don't want to see. I've got TFRs on. You can actually bring up the weather. You can bring up all the METARs and TAFs as well. So you can hover over here and see the different weather reports gets a little cluttered. So I'm going to shut off the TFRs and the weather information, drop the sigmets too. So what you can do here is you can zoom in on your particular area that you are flying in. So what I always suggest is to, in order to start learning sectionals, find an area of the country that you are already very familiar with. Okay. It just makes it a lot easier that you're not trying to identify new things. Okay. So I'm going to use Oshkosh, Wisconsin, okay? Mostly because that's actually where I learned how to fly, but a lot of pilots know about Oshkosh. There's obviously air ventures there. So we're going to take a look at the Oshkosh Airport, Appleton, Green Bay, New Holstein, this whole area, okay? Many of you have maybe been to Oshkosh, you're familiar with this area, but when you're learning how to use sectional charts, I always suggest using your neck of the woods that you're gonna, you're gonna know things, you're gonna know the railroad tracks. You're going to know the names of some of these checkpoints. You're going to know the names of some of these airports. All right. So you can see here on uh, Sky Vector, I'm on the world VFR chart. So the world VFR chart has got everything. It's all, it's taken, if you had all of the printed charts, it's seaming them all together into one big chart. Okay. So Oshkosh, uh, in app, this area right here is actually the cutoff between the Chicago and the Green Bay sectionals. So if I bring out just the Chicago sectional here, um, you can see that you know Oshkosh Appleton is right on the border there. If I go back to the world VFR and scroll up just a little bit, I go I now I have options to bring up the Green Bay sectional and the Chicago sectional. So if I bring up the Green Bay sectional, again, you can see Oshkosh is right on the border. So there's a little bit of an overlap between the two sectionals here. All right. So for this purpose, we're going to use the green, let's use the Chicago sectional. So in order to bring up the chart, all I do is I just click 
on the name of the city for the chart. So this one is the Chicago sectional. And if I zoom out, you can see that it's, this is the actual chart and what it looks like when it's a printed document. So if you're actually ordered the paper charts, this is what it would look like. It would be, it's pretty big you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe three feet by four feet or so. These are pretty big uh, documents when you get them in the printed version. And so it's very important to um, look at the legend and the margins. And so what I'm talking about the margins here is all this information in the margins of the chart. So you're going to want to read through all of that. And we're going to go over some of these in this video here, but this right here is going to be the legend. So if you think back to, you know, elementary school, when you were first learning how to read charts or read maps, um, you always had a legend. There's always symbols on maps and then the symbols are always defined in the legend. Okay. And the reason for this is because if you were to write all of these things out on the map or on the chart, it's going to clutter it up and it's going to make it very difficult to find anything. Okay. Then, so we're going to go over that in a little bit, a little bit more detail in a little while. So then over here in the margins of the chart, I've got control tower frequencies on the Chicago sectional chart. So any control tower that there, if there's a controlled airport with a control tower, it will have the, uh, the name of the airport, the hours of operations, and then the tower and ground and ATIS frequencies. So you can look that up here. So if you think about this, if you are a pilot flying an airplane, and you've got a printed copy of the chart, you've got all this information, you know, right there with you. So when I was first learning how to fly, this was all manual. You had everything was, you know, analog. We printed everything up. So we would have charts and put them on our knee boards and you fold everything up. So if you were to need additional information about an airport that maybe you weren't intending to go to, maybe there's weather, maybe there's, um, you have a fuel situation, something like this. You can come right to the margins of the uh, chart to get the airport frequencies that, that you need, okay? And then we've got some information about the special use airspace that are that's on the Chicago sectional chart. So we've got some restricted areas indicated by the R here, and it tells you up to what altitude is the restricted area, the time of use, and then the controlling agency or the contr uh, contact facility. So if you needed to get a hold of Minneapolis Center, they give you then the frequency that you can use to contact Minneapolis Center about that particular restricted area, all right? And then you've got the names of any MOAs that are on the sectional chart. So on the Chicago sectional, we've got, you know, uh, Hersey, Hilltop, Howard East, Howard West, Minnow, Prude. There's all these different MOAs that are on the chart. So military operating areas. It tells you up to what altitude is the MOA, and then it gives you the time of use and the controlling agency facility, and then the frequencies that you can contact somebody to get some guidance or get some more information about it. So now it's always important to remember that these MOAs, you know, say that this is from like this one right here, 12 mile east is 0900 to 30 minutes after sunset Monday through Saturday. It's important to know that there could be times outside of th that published timeline that that MOA could be in use, and that is going to be available to you via NOTAM. Then right here, we've got some information about uh, maximum elevation figures. So this is going to be an elevation that when we talk about latitude and long longitude, you've got these different quadrants. It creates these quadrants where inside that particular quadrant, that's going to be the maximum altitude of the highest obstacle in that particular quadrant. So for example, right here, we've got this two seven right here. So in this quadrant, right here of latitude and longitude in that quadrant, 2,700 feet is going to be the highest obstacle in that particular quadrant. Then you've got some information here about flight following services and NORAD procedures. Um, you know, flight following services are available on request and highly recommended in and around class B, C and TERSA areas. So there is a TERSA um, on the Chicago sectional right here. And this is the only one that I know of in the U.S. Um, I could be wrong. There could be more, but this is the only one that I'm aware of is the Rockford TERSA. So uh, TERSA is a special use airspace. It's a class Delta airspace with radar services. And so it's going to be identified here by this, um, by this, the gray circles. But you've also got the blue dashed lines to indicate that it is class Delta 
airspace there. So um, it's got, so it's got some information there for you about that. Then if you come over here to the left margin, again, we've got the legend. Then you've got, this would be the cover. If you were to have this printed up and, um, you know, folded up, this is what the cover would look like. It tells you that is the Chicago sectional. It's effective on 8 September, 2022 to 3 November, 2022. And then you, it, a reminder to consult NOTAMs to make sure that you have the latest information. Then this diagram right here tells you all the different VFR sectional charts and sort of you know where this one fits in. So we've got the Chicago sectional here, and then it tells you which particular, what are the major cities that have VFR terminal charts. So this magenta is going to be any cities that have the VFR terminal area charts that you can you can get as well. Not going to go over that today, but that is uh, some information for you there as well. Uh, then we've got uh, Milwaukee right here. So Milwaukee is doesn't have a terminal area chart, but it does have some congested airspace. So they've provided this little area here that things can be zoomed in. So if we go look at Milwaukee on the chart itself right here, um, it's, it's a very congested area, but it doesn't warrant a terminal area chart. So it, we've got this thing right here, Milwaukee inset, see, see inset chart for additional detail. That is this right here. So you come over here and it's zoomed in. And so you can get a little bit more detail. We've got the Waukesha Airport, the Lawrence Timmerman Airport, uh, Milwaukee Airport. There's a lot of stuff happening in this airspace here. We got some transition areas, all this kind of stuff. So they wanted to be able to give you a little bit more detail. And so you can find that there. Then we've got just some more information here about you know just how to, how to plot direct routes, things like that. That you can read through there. Then we've got information about different military training routes that there might be IFR and VFR military training routes. Um, we've got conversion of elevations from feet um, to meters and then a caution about severe turbulence. Uh, we've got just a few notes because it looks like Champaign here is right on the border. So we've got a you know, few notes that cross over into the margins here. Then we've also got a statement here. It says unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, may be approved to operate above critical infrastructure, including obstacles and linear features, such as high voltage power lines, pipelines, and railroads. So it's important for you to know as a manned aircraft pilot that there could be drones operating over these facilities doing some sort of surveying, okay? So to make sure there's a reminder here to check the NOTAM and the AIM for some details. So we've just got some information here, you know, tells us here that it's joining the St. Louis and Cincinnati charts down here. We've also got an Indianapolis inset that you can see, see on the St. Louis chart. So all sorts of really good information for you on the, on the margins of the chart. So when I say that you need to read the legend and read the margins, it's this. Get very familiar with all of the different control towers and all the different MOAs and all the different restricted airspace, prohibited airspace, special use airspace that's in your neck of the woods. Make sure that you're very aware of it, but then also don't get complacent with it because if when you fly in a certain area very frequently, you start to get a little, you might start to get a little complacent about some of the airspace and the, and the airspace rules in your area. And so you don't want to have that happen. So you want to make sure that you're staying up to date with, you know, frequencies, um, any sort of, you know, uh, any sort of procedures, things like that. You want to make sure that you are um, staying up to date and don't get complacent. So you want to make sure that you read the legend and the margins. Read the darn chart. Okay. So next here, so let's go over the legend a, a little bit. So next here we have the airport information. Okay. So now we're looking, this one here is the, is the Green Bay sectional. And so airports are going to be either, they're going to be color coded, but then they also have different shapes for different things. And again, this is to show you because if you are in a airplane and you're flying along and you need to get airport information, again, you should have all the airport information for your destination airport and your alternate airport if you need one. But it may happen that weather comes in and you've got to land somewhere else. Okay. So when you're in the airplane, it's very difficult to, you know, get out, you know, your facilities directory, get out some of this other information and try to find all this information. So they try to put as much information as what you would need in the airplane on the legend or on the chart itself. So you can figure out here that based on the shape of the airport, 
if it is paved or not, if it's a seaplane, if the runway length is greater than 8,069 feet, if there's a, a, a VOR, VOR, DME, DME, uh, DME or Vortac, you can figure all that out just by the shape of the airport. So for example, uh, you know, just this plain circle here is going to be, it's something not hard surface. So probably grass, gravel, dirt, something like that. Then you've got a uh, seaplane base. Then you've got this, the circle with the runways in there, runway or runways. You've got a hard surface runway, 1500 feet to 8,069 feet in length. So there's at least one, one runway that is at least 1500 feet up to 8,069 feet. Then if you've got where it's just sort of the runways are outlined here, the hard surface runways, uh, you're going to have something greater than 8,069 feet or multiple runways less than 8,069 feet. And then when you've got this open dot here, it's going to indicate that it is a hard surface runway that you're going to have perhaps some uh, radio aids to navigation. So that is what you can tell by the airport shape. Okay. Then you've got the circle R for the private airports. You've got the double circles for the military airports, helioports, unverified. They're just not certain exactly what type of surface that is. You maybe have an abandoned airport and um, ultralight parks. So this also indicates when you've got these ticks right here. And this is a question that I think I got this on my oral exam for my private pilot is what do these ticks mean? Um, and so that's going to tell you that there's fuel available at that particular airport, but that you should consult the chart supplement because uh, you there may not be fuel available at all, all, all the time. It may not be a 24-hour uh, service. So you want to make sure that you know exactly when you're going to be able to get um, get fuel. So we've got the star here indicates that there is an operate uh, rotating airport beacon that operates sunset to sunrise. Um, and objectionable means that airport may adversely affect airspace use. So if we go over here to the airport data, so when we're actually looking at the airport, so if we come back over here to our chart, I'm going to go back over here. We're going to use Oshkosh again, okay? So if I come over here, I've got the shape of the runway. So I know that I've got multiple runways or a one runway, at least 8,069 feet. I've got an operating beacon. Um, and then I've got all this information about the actual airport itself, okay? So we're gonna go over what some of these symbols mean, and then we'll come back over here and, and decipher this. So we're always going to have um, the name of the airport. You're gonna have the identifier, the ICAO identifier. You're going to have, uh, if there's no special VFR allowed, it's going to tell you that here. Um, you're going to have the control tower frequency. Um, then you've got, um, let's see, the star indicates that the op it operates part-time. So it's not necessarily a 24-hour um, control tower. Then you've got uh, the CTAF information. So C the circle C here follows the common traffic advisory frequency or CTAF. So you've got ATIS. So CTAF and ATIS is going to be 123.8 in this particular example here. You've got the runway length. Sorry, you've got the airport elevation. Then you've got the runway length. Then you've got the Unicom frequency. This tells you if you have a right pattern. You might see that here. RP is for a right pattern. And then you've got you know, a VFR advisory frequency, 125.0. There might be a weather camera in Alaska, and then there might be an airport of entry information. So those are the types of things that you might see on a um, chart with regards to airport information, okay? So if we come over here and look at Oshkosh, we've got the Whitman Regional Airport, OSH, is the ICAO identifier. Control tower is 118.5. It operates part-time, and uh, it operates, you've got CTAF and ATIS at 125.9. The elevation of the airport is 808. The length of, lo length of the longest runway is 8,000 feet. And then our Unicom frequency is 122.95. And then we've got information here about the Vortac um, as well. So that's going to be right below. It. That's going to be for this, um, uh, this sort of circle right here. Okay. So that is the type of information that you will see on the airport uh, airport data. So we just went over Oshkosh, so I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over this slide here. 
Then now let's talk about latitude and longitude. So what I alluded to earlier is that you've got the, the minimum elevation in each quadrant on the, um, on the chart. So you can and will get questions on your written exam on how to identify latitude and longitude on a chart. So latitude and longitude are going to be these black marks, these black tick marks right here is latitude and longitude. So let's go over. You can't really tell what the lat longs are right here because I don't have enough information on this screen grab. So if we come over here to sky vector again, let's go. There we go. So we come over here to sky vector again, you can see I've got the, you know, the black lines right here. And um, you got to, you got to just look for these, these black numbers here to figure out what is your latitude and longitude. So right here, we were at 88 degrees. So that's what this line of latitude is here. I'm sorry, this line of longitude is right here. And then we come over here and we've got another line with no number on it. And then we come over here, we've got a line that says 89 degrees. So this is going to be 89. This is going to be 88 degrees, 30 minutes. And then this is 88 degrees. Okay. And then right here, we've got 44 degrees, uh, a, a line of latitude. And then we have to go a little bit north here to see where's the next line. Uh, right here is the next line right here. There's no number on it. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. And then we've got 45 degrees. So we've got 44 down here, 44 degrees, 30 minutes, then 45 degrees. Okay, so that's the uh, the larger sort of you know framework for latitude and longitude. But then what you want to do is, you know, you might get a question on your exam that says something like, what is the uh, latitude and longitude of the plant right here? Okay. So the question is, is going to be, can you decipher these tick marks to be able to figure out what the lat longs are for that particular plant? So if we know that this is 44 degrees, 30 minutes, this is 45 degrees, each one of these tick marks is one. So one, two, three, four, five, six or so. So six below, six degrees, six minutes less than 45. So that's going to be 44 minutes and 54 seconds north. Okay. And then we're between the 88 and 89. So the 88 to 88 minutes, 30 seconds. We can either count forward or we can count backwards again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So 10 or 11. Um, so probably about 80 degrees, 20 minutes west is, is what that's going to be. So you each one of these tick marks is going to be one minute. So you can either count up from 88 degrees or you can count backwards from 88 degrees, 30 minutes, whichever way works for you. But you will probably get questions about that on, on your written exam. And then so when we were talking earlier about the minimum elevation, we've got these this quadrant right here. So your lines of latitude and longitude create this quadrant, all right? And so within this quadrant, the highest obstacle is 2,000 feet, okay? So you can kind of see if you can take a look around and see if you can figure out what it might be. There's a tower, uh, some sort of tower here at 1,100 feet, 1,300 feet. Um, but that would, if you stay at 2,000 feet or above, that will give you clearance over the highest obstacle in that particular um, quadrant. So not as big of a deal in flat Wisconsin. You get towers. Um, you'll get uh, water towers, radio towers, that kind of stuff. It's much more of a bigger deal when you get over to this side of the country where you've got mountains. All right. And so if I zoom in here on Arizona, you know, you've got some that are 7,200, 8,400, 6,000 feet, 4,700 feet. So you can see that you've got, you know, the Phoenix Valley here that's much lower, 3,500 feet, um, you know, all the way up on the other side of the valley is 8,000 feet. All right. So, you know, th there's there's going to be some, some obstacles in the way in the shape of mountains. <laughs> so that's going to be uh, valuable information for you, especially if you're flying at night. So that is latitude and longitude. Now let's talk a little bit about airspace. Let's do a very, very, very quick review of airspace so that we can learn how to identify airspace on the VFR sectional charts. So the National Airspace System, it's going to be any of the airspace navigation facilities and airports in the United States. 
that some of them are shared jointly with the U.S. military. There's controlled and uncontrolled airspace. There's six different airspace classes. There's special use airspace. There's other airspace. Each airspace is going to have geographical boundaries that are going to be, def- most of them are going to be defined here on the chart. Each airspace has its own weather minimums and it has federal guidelines and regulations. So what is controlled airspace versus uncontrolled airspace? So controlled airspace is going to be airspace where there are air traffic control services. All right. So it's, it's different from towered and non-towered. So you're going to have towered airports and non-towered airports. A non-towered airport can still be in controlled airspace. Okay. Um, it's just that it does air traffic control provide services. Doesn't mean air traffic control needs to be on that airport. Okay. The level of service is going to depend on the class of airspace. And then uncontrolled airspace is air traffic control services are not provided at all. And again, just because uh, an airport doesn't have a control tower, it doesn't mean that it's non-controlled. Okay. So the, con- the lack of a control tower does not mean it's an uncontrolled airport. So this is just a quick review of the sort of upside down wedding cake diagram in the, from the AIM that shows all the different types of airspace. So you've got class D here, which is really sort of just your, your like silo, you know, cylinder shape. Then you've got your class C, which is going to come, you know, start here at the surface, but then it's going to branch out as you get up higher in altitude. And then you've got class B, which has got that additional layer on top of what you would normally see on class C. Then you've got class G airspace down here towards the ground. Um, and in other parts, maybe outside of the outside of the borders of the country might come up a little bit higher. And then everything else in here we, is where we've got our class E, our class echo airspace. And then from 18,000 feet MSL to flight level 600 is where we've got our class alpha airspace. So that's just a very quick reminder of the different types of airspace. So not going to go into a whole lot of details here, but what is special use airspace? So we've got a couple different types of special use airspace that you're going to see on sectional charts. You're going to see prohibited areas, restricted areas, warning areas, MOA, alert areas, and controlled firing areas. Um, actually, controlled firing areas you're not going to see on sectional charts, but it is a part of special use airspace. There's also no drone zones, local airport advisories, military training routes, TFRs, there's permanent ones, there's temporary ones, even though it's called a temporary flight restriction, there are permanent TFRs out there. Uh, any sort of parachute operations, VFR ro- routes, uh, TERSAs, SFRAs, special air traffic rules, weather reconnaissance areas, national security areas, the ADAs, and then the, the, the freeze that you see around Washington, DC. So let's talk about how to actually identify airspace on the VFR sectional charts. So you've got your legend, So again, if you cannot remember, come over to your legend to look and see what they're trying to tell you here. A solid blue line, class B airspace. Solid magenta line, class Charlie airspace. Dotted or dashed blue line, class delta airspace. The the box with the number in it, the ceiling of class delta airspace in hundreds of feet, a minus ceiling value indicates surface up to, but not including that value, okay? So if you see a minus in front of there, and you'll see this around some very congested airspace where it'll say, you know, the class delta airspace goes up to, but not including 4,000 feet because at 4,000 feet, you've transitioned into class delta, or I'm sorry, class Charlie or class Bravo airspace, okay? The dotted magenta line is a surface transition for class echo airspace. You've got the class uh, E airspace with the floor at 700 feet above the surface that laterally abuts class G airspace. That's going to be the shaded magenta lines. Class E airspace with floor 700 feet above the surface that laterally abuts uh, 1,200 feet or higher class E airspace. And then you're going to see the, the shaded blue line that says class echo airspace with the floor at 1,200 feet or greater above the surface that laterally abuts class G or class Gulf airspace, okay? And then you might see these sort of, you know, these interlocking lines here, one that says 2,400 MSL, one that says 4,500 MSL. That's going to differentiate the floors of class echo airspace greater than 700 feet above the surface. So any sort of class echo airspace that extends that's going to give you um, some more information about where that class echo airspace actually is, okay? Then you've got um, some routes um, that are going to be identified here. So we've got like right here, we've got this federal airway 
it's a VFR uh, route that shows that it's at 130 degrees. Um, 132 degrees is the direction. It's a Victor 69 is the name of the Victor Airway. And then um, the total mileage between the nav aids on the direct airway is 169 mileage between those particular nav aids. And then we've got some information here about some of the nav aids that might be used on that Victor Airway. Then you've got the dashed lines here that show the prohibited, restricted, and warning areas. You've got this that shows the, uh, the magenta color shows the MOAs. Then you've got the slanted lines, which indicate the blue slanted lines indicate the special air traffic area, airport traffic areas. And then you've got the slanted uh, magenta lines, which is the national defense temporary flight restriction area. That's, you're going to see that um, around the, the freeze. You've got the ADIS, which is the air defense identification zone. You've got a mode C veil that you'll see around class Bravo airspace, mode C veil and ADSB out. You've got a national security area, a TERSA. And then a military training route is going to be identified, excuse me, identified in the, um, the, the light shaded gray. So let's go over to the chart. Okay. So again, we're going to go back to this area. There's not a whole heck of a lot happening here. Um, so it's pretty simple. We've got our class Charlie airspace here around Green Bay. Solid magenta line. The inner circle goes from the surface to 4,700 feet. The outer circle starts at 1,900 feet and goes to 4,700 feet. Okay, so the tops of the class Charlie airspace, 4,700 feet. If you're at 4,750, 4,800, you are above the class Charlie airspace. Okay, We've got a Victor Airway here. It's at 204, and it, the Victor Airway connects between um, the Green Bay VOR and the Oshkosh VOR. All right, so you've got that information there. Then. You've got the class Delta Airport, the blue dotted line, all the way up to 3,400 feet, up to and including 3,400 feet. Now, again, if you see that negative, it means it's up to but not including 3,400 feet. That might be a question you might see on your oral exam. Then if we come over here, we've got the shaded area where the class E airspace transitions down to 700 feet. AGL. If you come up here, Rhinelander Airport here, you've got the transition area right here, but you've also got the Class E surface transition area right here as well, where the Class Echo airspace actually drops all the way down to the ground. And so that's where you'll see that dotted magenta line there. Okay. Um, let's go over to Maryland. And the Washington, D.C. area, we could do a whole session on just understanding the airspace in the Washington, D.C. area. Okay. So we're not going to go into too much detail here, but you can see the restricted areas here. We've got the prohibited area indicated right here. We've got a restricted area as well. The restricted area overlies the prohibited area. We've got the Let's see here. The Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Area Special Flight Rules Area Flight Restricted Zone, D.C. FR, SFRA, and D.C. Freeze. See description in Atlantic Ocean. Okay. So if I come over here to the Atlantic Ocean, we got a whole description here. Where it tells you exactly what you need to do and what you need to follow. All the different... Um, positions of the DC freeze and DCS FRA. Okay. Um, you can see we've got the flight restricted zone right here around DC proper. We've got some prohibited areas here. That's going to be around, you know, the Pentagon, the White House, that kind of stuff is right there. But then you've got the special flight rules area right here. Um, this is sort of the, the, the gate that is for that particular area um, you need to have permission, you need to be on a flight plan, there needs to be special training that you have to do to enter that particular airspace. Again, we could we could spend an entire hour just talking about that type of airspace, okay? Then if you come over here to the borders of the country, this is where you're going to see that Class E uh, transition areas, and then you're also going to see the contiguous, contiguous ADAs, contiguous U.S. ADAs, 
So you can see how they are depicted right on the charts. So that is how you're going to identify some of the different types of airspace. So if we come back up here, what you really want to do is now that you've gone through the legend of your chart, you know what all the different symbols mean. You can go through and you can spend some time studying the chart of the area that you fly in, the area that you live in, the area that you know very well, the area that you grew up. It might not even be where you live and where you're flying. It might be the area that you grew up and you just know it very well. Okay. You just know that area. I know where New London is. I've been to New London. I know what it is. I know Shyacton Airport. I know that they're very active with skydivers there. All right. I know, I know who the Wings with Halos guys are. I know you know the new New Holstein Airport very well. I know this railroad track. I know this railroad track very well. I know exactly where it is. I know this highway. This is Highway Ten. All right. I know that highway. I drive it. I know Lake Poygan. I've boated on Lake Poygan. Okay. So you can start picking out different landmarks, different things that you identify that you just you already know. And then when you start looking around and you're like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. Then that's when you start doing some investigating. So for example, Denmark over here, Denmark is underlined in black, underlined with a magenta flag there. Maybe I don't remember what that flag means. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to go look at the margins. We're going to go look at the legend and see if we can find that flag. See where it is. Look at this. Right here's the flag. Okay. It actually doesn't even tell you exactly what it is here. <laughs> it's probably not the best example, but the flag is going to tell you what that particular checkpoint is that if you tell air traffic control that I am over Denmark, they're going to know what that means. They're going to know, okay, you are you know, right over this lice or uh, this um, railroad track over Denmark. Okay. They're going to know exactly what you mean. You tell Green Bay Approach that you're over New Franken. They know what that is. You talk to Green Bay Approach, you're at Dykesville. They know what that is. Okay. Come down here to Madison. Same thing. Tell them that I am at Columbus. They know what that means. I'm at Cambridge. They know what that means. I'm at Oregon. They know what that means. Okay. So those are checkpoints that you can use, right? But my point here is take an area and get to know it, learn it and learn it from the perspective of when you are up in the air, because some of these things are going to be things like, okay, yeah, I know exactly what that is. I did get a question once of if you can get sectional charts that have roads overlaid on them. And the answer is no. And it's like, there's no like sort of, you know, API or anything to integrate with Google, uh, Google maps, things like that. If that's going to just, um, add way too much clutter to the chart and it's just going to be too much. Okay. But if you notice though, like there's some major highways here, like this is highway 41 that goes, um, from Oshkosh to Milwaukee. So they're going to put major highways here, but they're not going to have all the different roads and everything that maybe you're familiar with because when you're in the air, you pro sometimes you might not even be able to see those roads. Sometimes they're so narrow, you don't even see them. Um, but second of all, it's really just going to start cluttering up your, your chart. So you, um, you're not going to get that. So, okay. So class A airspace, um, we talked about a little bit about class A airspace. Class A airspace, you are not going to see on VFR sectional charts because it starts at 18,000 feet MSL up to flight level 600. So you just, you're not, it's just not charted. You're just not going to have it on there. Class Bravo airspace, again, you're going to see, this is Chicago here. You're going to see the blue, solid blue line here. Okay. We've got a couple of different rings. So we've got here, um, our inner ring here. Then we've got our first ring is starts at 1900 feet up to 10,000 feet. Our inner ring is surface to 10,000 feet. We've got a cutout of the ring right here because we've got an airport right there. Okay. So this is a good example right here where the class Delta airspace goes up to, but not including 3000 feet up to, but not including 3,000 feet. Well, that's what that little minus sign means there, okay? 
outside of that, we're in our ring at 2,500 feet. Starts our class Bravo airspace up to 10,000 feet. The next ring here, we've got 3,600 feet to 10,000 feet. But you see this line right here? That means that there is, there's another line right here. That means that inside this particular spot right here, this the, the lower level of the class Bravo airspace is at 4,000 feet. Okay. So right here, if you're flying along at you know, 3,700 feet thinking you're not in the class Bravo airspace. And then you come over here, you're in Algonquin and you're at 3,700 feet. Now you're in the class Bravo airspace. Okay. And then um, as you come out more, you've got 4,000 feet to 10,000 feet. And again, we've got this full circle here and same thing. It kind of, you know, butts out here, this 4,000 to 10,000 kind of, you know, fills in right there. Okay. So we've got another Class Delta Airport here goes up to 3,200 feet. So if you're flying along right here, you're not in the class Bravo, you're at 3,200 feet. You're not in any, you're not in the class Bravo, 3,200 feet, you're at class Delta, 3,200 feet, you're, um, you're below the class Bravo, all right? So, and then you've got the Mode C Veil and the ADSB out. So within 30 nautical miles, that indicates that you need to have a Mode C an ADSB out to be there. So even if you're not intending to enter the class Bravo airspace, you do need to have that functionality on your airport or on your airplane. Then you've got the class Charlie airport uh, airspace here. Milwaukee is a good example. We've got the solid magenta lines, surface to 4,700 feet, 1,900 to 4,700 4, feet. And it's pretty simple. There's just two simple um, you got, we got our simple, well, let me take that back. So it looks like on the shoreline here is where we've got a transition area. So if you're over the water in this second circle here, 1,900 to 4,700 feet is the class Charlie. But then if you're over the land, the class Charlie actually starts at 2,200 feet. So the class Charlie starts a little bit lower when you're actually over the water. All right, we've got our checkpoints. You can contact Milwaukee Approach, tell them you're at Muskego Lake, you're at Hales Corners. They know what all of those those checkpoints are, the filtration, filtration plant, uh, that kind of thing. You could tell them I'm 10 miles north of the filtration plant. They know what that means, all right? Then you've got the information about that particular airport. You've got some information about some obstacles. We've got a stack right here. Um, we've got a, a soft field right here. We've got the Waukesha County Airport right here. We've got the Timmerman Airport right here. So you can see here, we've got class delta overlapping the um the class uh charlie airspace right here okay so the class Char class delta goes up to 3200 feet all right so we're operating up to 3200 feet right here waukesha goes up to 3400 feet then class delta air airspace the blue dotted lines here indicates it's class delta airspace We've got a checkpoint in here. You can tell that to air traffic control. They'll know exactly what you're talking about if you're at Fisk, Lake Butamore, the Warbird Island. Um, these are used a lot, obviously because of the air show, these checkpoints are used a lot. But even if you are just flying into Oshkosh any other time of the year, you can use these checkpoints um, and they certainly know what that means. Then we've already gone over Rhinelander, but we've got this class E surface transition area here that's identified by those dotted magenta lines. And then class G is just, you're not gonna have anything around it. It's, you know, it's, we've got this Iron County Airport here. Um, it's a class in class G airspace there. Then we've talked about minimum elevation and that particular number there. Then you've got different obstructions. So the obstructions are going to be, you've got different shapes for the obstructions, depending on the height of the obstruction. And so a thousand feet or higher, above 200 feet, but it's below a uh, thousand feet. That's for the different reason for the different, for the different shapes of the obstruction. One thing it is important to note is that a lot of uh, 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 towers can have these guy wires that can extend outward from the structures. That's really important um, because if you are doing an off-field landing and you're coming close to a tower, you need to be aware that there could be those guy wires coming off of that off that tower. And then terrain. So terrain, like I showed you with Arizona, it can be much more, um, much different than just flying over flat Wisconsin, right? So when you're looking at areas where there could be different mountains um, 
and different types of you know hilly terrain or mountainous terrain you're going to look at a couple things you can look at these contour lines right here so we've got this contour line right here is 3500 feet 3500 feet here's one at 3000 feet so the closer they are together the the steeper that terrain is going to be on um, the farther apart they are obviously the the less steep it's going to be that the, the, on the incline but then you've got the different color coding here that will tell you what is the um what is the highest elevation in that particular area so again if we zoom this out let's go take a look at arizona um and we've got california that area here but you can see that we've got some darker browns here that indicates that we're at a the terrain is at a much higher altitude so if i zoom in here we're at ten thousand feet on this line of contour nine thousand feet right here eighty five hundred feet so we're getting we're getting pretty steep these 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 contour lines are are getting very 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 close so that tells me that there are, there's going to be mountains here. And so again, if I look at this quadrant right here within this quadrant, the highest obstacle is at 13,300 feet. So if I stay above 13,300 feet, I should be okay with clearance from any obstacles, including mountains in this particular quadrant um, on the VFR sectional chart. All right, so that is a very, very, very quick rundown on vfr sectional charts a lot of information on them i showed you just a couple of the highlights of them where to find more information read the margins read the legend use that information and just read the darn chart look at it see if you can figure it out that way so here are a few of my social media accounts that you can um, connect with me on i've got a facebook group uh, facebook instagram linkedin a youtube channel and you can find a lot of other really great, helpful educational information in all of those different places. So I hope this video was helpful for you as you are trying to learn how to use and read VFR sectional charts. And please stay tuned. I will be making a lot more of these types of videos either for my YouTube channel or for my Aviation Academy, where you will get to learn some of these more topics, these topics in much more detail. So thank you, and I'll see you in the next class.